Hello and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sails podcast from Common Room Radio. I am Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. And we have a special guest, just like in our season one wrap. Lauren mm-hmm. Sarner has joined us for our season two wrap, and she's come to us from Inverse.com. Thank you hey, for hi, having me again. Welcome, Lauren. Yay. <laughs> We're so happy to have you. This is great. <laughs> Um, for any listeners who, for some reason, uh, skipped the season one wrap, uh, I cover black sales uh, for Inverse, uh, but also you should go back and listen to the show in order because it's a very good podcast. Oh, oh thank thanks. you, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited for this tonight. We have a drinking game that we have decided to attempt to do throughout this podcast for season two. So really quick before we go any further, I'm going to let everybody know what the rules are. So you can play along at home if you're not, you know, driving or at work or what have you. So we are going to drink when we say Gen X, when anyone gets adult feelings, when we say Toby Schmitz, when we we name a ship. Because we love him. Because he's the best. Yeah. Because who doesn't want to drink and talk about Toby Schmitz? Nobody exactly. I know. <laughs> uh, when we name a ship, which also might give me adult feelings. So that might be two drinks. Uh, Dimples McGraw. Also, that's a fan favorite. When we hate on Eleanor or when someone groans audibly in despair. <laughs> <laughs> Which basically means, yeah, that basically means, and Liz, you know, Liz set this up. This basically means that we're going to be drinking the whole time. (laughs) Pretty pretty tipsy evening, I think. It's a very convivial atmosphere this evening in the studio. Yes. Well, we have two things. Well, we have three things to celebrate. We are celebrating that Lauren's joining us. Uh Uh-huh. We're celebrating that it is National or International Podcasting Day. Oh, yeah, it sure is. It is. It is, actually. Wait, what was that? Oh, and the last thing was that we love season two. It's so great. And we're kind of sad to see it go. So we'll raise a glass to season two. Indeed. I really am sad to see season two go. I forgot just how much the show really does. It it just elevates itself after season one. I mean, season one is is such a almost a prologue. It's such a buildup. And then we really get to find out. So, I mean, gosh, the character arcs in this season are insane. Well, also, season one was good, but, I mean, as we discussed the last time we were here, it still does have some flaws. And honestly, I don't think I would be able to write about the show the way I do if it only went the way it went in season one. Like, season two was what Uh grabbed me. And, like, when I write Mm -hmm. about the show, I really do kind of go to bat for it in my writing because... There is a dearth of writing about it on the internet, which is bad, so I feel like I should fill in that space, Um, and I wouldn't feel the need to do that if it wasn't for season two. That completely makes sense. Because season two is so outstanding, yeah, and I was like, why is nobody Mm -hmm. else talking about how outstanding this is? The world needs to know. (laughs) (laughs) And so different from anything else that's on TV. This season in particular, I think, just tackled such big issues and and i i keep on going back to that i should have put that in the drinking game the human condition but it does right it's so much in this season just gosh the the things we see these characters walking through are just extraordinary but i think also what impressed me was that anything i was like a little bit concerned about in season one because i was in by season one i was intrigued but i wasn't yet ready to be like this is my favorite show but i was like i'm intrigued uh-huh. enough to keep watching because but there were still some things i was concerned about as i brought up like uh mm. we talked about eleanor uh I talked about, I mean, that's kind of ballsy for the writers to not give us the motives of the main character. We didn't know Flint's motives. Oh right. right. Um, that is ballsy. Yeah. yeah. And I was also like, what are you guys doing with Silver? Like, I was still like, <laughs> what, where is this going? <laughs> um, and, and, I was, and, they- and I was also concerned that Vane's story seemed kind of divorced from the main narrative. So these were all things I was like, well, I'm a little concerned. Uh, yeah. um, and Often when you're concerned about things in a show and it fixes them, it, like, still takes several episodes. But season yeah. two, fr- the first episode fixes everything I was concerned about in season one. Like, it doesn't take oh, a while. Wow. It fixes it in no, the very first true. episode. It's totally true. It's totally true. Yeah, I mean, I think I had about the same experience. Like, season one was like, hmm. This is different and interesting. And season two, I fell in love. And, you know, yeah. we, know we, we know how that turned out. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Um, all right. So let's get into our questions that I have for you, ladies. Okay. Uh, uh, I thought we would start, we usually end our show with favorites, but I thought we'll start with favorites this time since we're covering oh. the whole season. Okay. So what's your favorite line? Liz, what's your favorite line of season two? Oh, my favorite line. See, and I was going to go in the opposite order to talk about my favorite scene first. So my favorite line, ooh, is has got to be when Jack first walks in on Anne and Max and gives that wonderful speech about, I can understand why you wouldn't want to tell me this, but please understand that I have only ever wanted to make you happy or whatever mm -hmm. it was. That scene just sticks in my mind so much. And Toby Schmidt's drink sells oh, it drink. so much. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Let me uncork my bottle here. Yeah. <laughs> His performance is so lovely there, and both the girls are staring back at him. That that line stuck with me for a long time after I had moved on even to the next season. I just remembered that moment very much. All right, Lauren, what's yours? I want to say it's that super eloquent one that Flint says about the shifting sands and the order of things at the mm -hmm. end of uh, 210. But really... yes. And that I do love that line, but I think I'm going to go mm -hmm. with uh, Anne's to Jack. I'll never be your wife, but we'll be together till they put us in the fucking ground. Um, that is a good one, too. Yep, that is a good one. Mm. Because, yeah, Anne and Jack are actually, I think, my favorite couple on TV. Um, and that just solidified how much wow. I really love Anne's character so much. Um, and I, I actually just listened to um, your podcast of that episode and I actually think I disagree with uh, your reading of why Jack is looks upset in that moment. Um, oh. I think he looks upset because uh, she, she was talking about how um, every time she walked into a tavern and she said her name, people would say his name. Um, uh -huh. And she didn't like that because, you know, she didn't want that to be part of her identity. And I think... He is upset because he is realizing that they have different values because obviously identity is such an important part of who he is. Because um, uh -huh. it's always kind of upsetting to oh, realize wow. a loved one doesn't share your core values. Like you were even kind of saying earlier, you're upset that your husband doesn't like black sales as much as you do. <laughs> and that's yeah, that's true. <laughs> I forgive him for it. I still love him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so at least that, that was my interpretation of why Jack was upset. Just the kind of uh, realizing that like his his sense of you know his legacy and personhood and identity is not something that Anne values i okay well i was i one of one of my in my list was the one jack I know, said right? i only want really you to be yeah it i know um <laughs> well and i do feel like on some levels we're probably end of season two uh biased a little bit because we've been closer to that just mm -hmm. recently i got to say though um for me it's when silver says my men oh that's it that's my favorite it's thing simple and but it's great yeah well, and it's not simple, and we'll get into that next season, but sure. but it's such, I mean, like you said that you were, wait, no, Lauren, wait, which of you said, one of you, Lauren said that you were upset about about what they did with Silver in the beginning. This this was the moment, I think I said this in the last episode, this was the moment when I realized that what they were doing with Silver was a million times more interesting than mm -hmm. what I th thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, and his, yeah, his arc. God, it's hard for me to say because everyone knows how much I love Flint and this season <laughs> really is all about Flint in so many ways but um, yeah like watching Silver become the person he becomes by the end of season two is so phenomenal it's really mm -hmm. such an amazing thing so wow. I'm going to go with that one I, would, I wasn't uh, upset by what they were doing with Silver I was more just kind of dubious and skeptical sure um, sure yeah right. for example did did either of you two ever watch the show uh, Once Upon a Time? Yes, I tried. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. I, I, yeah, I had to quit too. Because uh, that show theoretically could have been interesting. It's taking characters yeah. from famous old right. stories that we know, just like yep. Silver is a character from a famous old story that we know. But it was just mm -hmm. like uh, sexy Captain Hook, sexy Little Red Riding Hood, sexy right. Pinocchio. <laughs> I was like, sexy Pinocchio? Are you kidding? And so... <laughs> 
I kind of thought that was like <laughs> season one silver. I was I was kind of like dubious because I thought that kind of thing was what they were doing. I was like, no, 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 this yeah. is not what this character should be. That's funny. No, that's <laughs> I mean that's fun. That is funny, and it actually is a totally legitimate fear at the time. I think. I think when I first started watching, I was less thinking about Treasure Island, to be honest. I was more just kind of in this show. But I, it's funny because they are actually, it turns out that they're actually very much intentionally playing that thing. Like they're exactly using that expectation you might have in such a beautiful way by making Silver, you know, have it be a proper arc, not just like, a, a, yeah. you know, not just pretty, pretty John Silver. <laughs> So in any so in a way it's like doubly good for me is that is that they actually are using that crazy belly flopping pretty boy right. version of of silver to like show us how you know what a crazy thing for him to become the silver of Treasure yeah. Island. Well and it's funny for me because I never because he was so smarmy and just so oily I never thought of him as pretty. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I, now that you're saying it, I'm like, I can totally see that, though. Of course, cause obviously, like, Luke Arnold is an attractive man. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. But just John Silver himself, I just thought of as, like, this greasy-haired punk kid who's, you know, the Draco Malfoy of black sails, basically. So. <laughs> it just didn't occur to me. But I right. totally see what you're saying, especially with those sea-colored eyes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just, right. And I can't wait to talk about this next season, to be honest. I mean, it's just, ah, Silver's arc is really good, and Luke Arnold's doing a really good job of it. Oh, wait, I yeah. just sighed. Does that mean we have to drink? Was That that wasn't in despair. <laughs> no, no, that was a good groan. That's a good drink. Yep, you're right. I'm so used to it from you. It'll be hard to catch them. <laughs> I do it. I do it with joy and with sorrow and with the mix of yeah. the two, because that's it usually what I'm experiencing. It not really be despair. I just wrote groans audibly. It just... Typically, that's my job. <laughs> that's my job. All right, let's move on. What's your favorite scene, ladies? Let's start with Lauren this time. Uh, my favorite scene has to be uh, in the very first episode of season two, um, Flint and Silver. The you mean I really have to fight? And then what the fuck did you think was going to happen? <laughs> it's, it's a great scene. Everything about nope. that scene is so perfect. A because it makes me laugh every time, and I've seen it countless times. Um, and B, because even though it's really funny in the, in the typical manner of the show, it's, it's not just there to make us laugh. Like, it actually right. does have a very interesting and important plot significance that has an interesting payoff in season three. Season three, episode three, and episode seven in particular, for those of you who have <laughs> already watched season three. <laughs> um, so it's like an interesting moment between Flint and Silver. Um, yes. And like I said, I season one Silver, also another thing that made me skeptical of him, was I felt like his character was too much telling and not enough showing on the writer's part in terms uh -huh. of like, he was sure. just like saying, I am likable. And I was like, okay, you can't just say that. You have to show us. But now I feel like the writers are purposely doing that to make us underestimate him. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't even that I needed to see him in an action scene because he was kind of terrible at the action, which was amazing to see. Um, but just to see. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the moment the moment I started getting invested in Silver and liking Silver, uh, what well, was actually his face on the beach before when uh, Flint says "you shit" yep. and he does that yep. little like "what did I do" face? Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great moment. <laughs> um, and then the way I don't know if this was like on purpose or not, but the way Toby Stevens' voice cracks on the "what the fuck did you think was going to happen" line. It's perfect. <laughs> Liz, favorite scene? Uh, I guess for a favorite scene, I'm, I am going to I am going to change it just a little bit. The other scene that stuck with me from this fr from this season so much is at the dinner table when we first see Thomas kiss James. And I was just like, what the hell is the show doing? Nothing is what I thought it was. And I am, I just had to like reconfigure everything that I thought in my mind. And it was this really beautiful moment. It was really well done. And I loved, I, I know it doesn't count as one scene, but the way they showed us the preamble to that first, like episodes before, maybe it was just mm -hmm. one episode before. One episode before, to, yeah. So you put it together in your head. You didn't even see the whole scene, but... It, it came back to get like you had the ghost of the old scene where he mm -hmm. had stood up for him in your head still. And it was just beautiful. It was beautiful work. 
It is. It is. All right. Well, my favorite, I think I gave mine away a long time ago because when we were on that episode, I, uh, oh, yep. and I'm not sure which number it is. I, I declared it my favorite scene in all of television ever, <laughs> which is when Flint takes back his ship. Yeah. God, oh my that's God. cool. I like bad ass moment. It's so Jeez, I forgot about that. Yeah, beautiful. that's beautiful. Yeah, that's I mean, that's ah, picking that's, favorites is really hard. Yeah, that one's not hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't was joking. Awesome. I wasn't joking. Best bet favorite scene ever in all of television. So that one was wow. easy for me. Yep. That gosh, Love that it. was awesome. It is. Man, that it was is. a spectacle to behold the first time. Yep. Yeah, that man is incredible. It's also a moment where, like, he's so stone cold that, like, had he been played by a lesser actor and had the writing been less strong, we, it, it would yes. be impossible to like him for that. But, like, yep. it just works so well. Yeah. That's right. Because that's, that's fairly early on, too, right? That's got to be... Yeah, it's early on in season. It's and, you know, be and one he, or two. It's, two, it's probably... It's pretty soon after he killed Gates. So like, I mean, that's what you I'm could, saying. That's what I was going to say. Right. Yeah, you it's could so kind soon of... after he killed Gates. Yep. And it's before you know his backstory. So. Yeah. So you're right. We should hate him in that moment. But instead, we kind of have adult feelings. Yeah. No. Well, oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> adult feelings for me. That's a drink, drink. too. Yep. Drink. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to say, like, I mean, what you just said about about Toby Stevens and Flint. It really is relevant to the whole show, or at least the first, you know, first 12 episodes. Like, we really should kind of hate him all through season we one. Yeah. And we don't. And, you know, and Liz and I, we talked about this a lot, and probably the three of us talked about this in the last rap. Like, you kind of, like, feel for him personally the most while he's killing our favorite character. Yeah. And somehow he manages to make that a moment where we have so much sympathy for Flint. And yeah, Toby Stevens. I know. All right. Next, ladies, Mm -hmm. is favorite character arc. This one feels impossible. Me, I'm starting. Oh, gosh. Impossible. Okay. Favorite character arc is going to have to be Anne Bonnie. That's what I thought you were going to say. Yeah, you, really? Gosh, I wrestled yep. with that for a really long time because there are <laughs> oh. so many fantastic character arcs. But when no, she I was, was able to sure. have the conversation with uh, with Jack on the bow of the ship at, at in the very end and and have the balls to say, I can't be your wife, but we're going to be partners. And gosh, and again, that haunting imagery where she was in the dress and looking in the mirror. Oh, mm-hmm. man, it was an amazing character arc. So yep. great. All right, Lauren, you're next. I mean, anyone who reads my articles is probably not too surprised that I'm going to say Charles Vane. <laughs> <laughs> I predicted Charles that Vane as well. Charles Vane was a close well. second for me. He was so um, cool. Yeah. No, but I will tell you why, because I, I mentioned uh-huh. last time I was on that although he's one of my favorites, I actually really didn't like him the first time I saw season one. And you know what? Mm-hmm. I actually didn't really like him most of the way the first time I saw through se- saw um, season two for the first time as well, because I thought he was really short-sighted, mm-hmm. and he, he was, was always getting in Flint's way. Yeah. And I also thought in terms of like what the writers were doing with him, I kind of thought uh, he seems like a very obvious character on the surface. Like, I mean, he's just like, yeah, he's just kind of all brute force and... I thought it was kind of cheesy the way they always have him shirtless. I thought uh, they were kind of trying too hard with that. Um. <laughs> so, I think some Sorry. people would have no problem with him being shirtless. All no, the time. I just, I just mean the way they were doing it felt very like blatant and uh, a little heavy-handed. A exactly, little heavy-handed. it felt oh, no, heavy-handed. No, um, and yeah, I didn't think he was that interesting in part because I felt his presentation was very heavy-handed. Sure. And he also kind of actually, he seemed like the least unique character because every show kind of has a the crazy guy kind of character. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. So I kind of thought that's just what he was. And actually, this was another contender for my possible favorite line. It was when he, in epi- at the end of uh, two, episode nine of season two, when he says, I say we get him the hell out of there, or I suggest, or whatever he says. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. 
it's because that one line made me reevaluate everything I thought I knew about him. And I was like, holy yeah. shit, I have been reading this guy wrong this entire time. And I was like, I need to go back and rewatch every scene he's in. And then I noticed all the wonderful yep. nuance that you've been talking about. But so basically, his character is single-handedly responsible for me kind of seeing the value. Because you guys always talk about, um, like, you're, you always say, oh, like, this time when I rewatched, I paid attention to Billy. Or this time, I paid attention to Max. Like, part mm-hmm. of why this show is good to rewatch is because if it's a kind of a different show depending on who you pay attention to in any given scene. Yeah. And I feel, totally like, I feel like I didn't realize that until I was forced to go back and rewatch to reevaluate Charles Vane's character. So Charles Vane is another part of why I cover the show the way I do, because he showed me that the, the value of a rewatch and like part of the yeah, reason yeah. part of the reason the show is so good is its characters, yes, its writing, yes, its acting, yes. But it also kind of, uh, in a way, um, reframes how you watch television. Because there isn't really another show that you watch in this way. Like, I can't really... Like, there are other shows you certainly rewatch, but I think mm-hmm. this show has better rewatch value than others. Um, yeah. Well, it changes your whole perspective of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I definitely would not have realized that if I wasn't forced to first reevaluate Charles Wayne's character, so... Mm-hmm. Even though oh, that's so great. I also totally love Flint's season two arc, but I'm going to have to give yeah. this one to Vane just because it has helped my own coverage of the show. <laughs> <laughs> totally fair. Yeah, I, it was a close second for me for favorite scenes when they are on the block together there on, on uh, the season finale. And the looks they it's exchange. Just so love it so good. much. Yeah. <laughs> and that scene that I needed to quote verbatim on both sides. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the one that finally hooked Sarah. So yes. now Sarah is texting me and saying, hey, can we watch Black Sails? <laughs> yes, so we can. Great. Yes, we can. That's so great. <laughs> All right. I'm coming, I'm coming back to Oklahoma because I need to do that with y'all. Yeah, you are. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> um, okay. Well, mine. Whoa. This is hard. This is really hard for yeah. me. I'm going to I'm going to a little bit cop out because I'm going to I was I was re-listening to some of our our older episodes to kind of prepare Mm -hmm. questions for this. And I actually said something that is totally true. And I didn't really at the end of the season, even though I said I was going to, I didn't I didn't actually like explain myself. Okay. Um, I said it's I guess it must have been episode 13 or maybe it was episode 14. Um, I said that this season has essentially two gifts. And these gifts, these presents are unwrapped slowly. I was going to say gifts or gifts. Yeah, I know, I know. And I realized, <laughs> okay, right, sorry. Gotcha. I'm there with a T. Excellent. <laughs> Two presents. And each mm-hmm. one of them unwrapped themselves slowly. And it was really challenging for me throughout covering it to not jump the gun. I think I actually did once or twice by accident. Uh, so the first one obviously is is Flint. And so, you know, that's kind of my, you know, up until episode 13, when we find out what what, what it is that started all of this, that they had been right. alluding to all this mm-hmm. time. So that's that's present number one that we basically had unwrapped for 12 episodes. Yeah. Um, and then the second present is when Silver says, my men. And this is also yeah. this process mm-hmm. that you watch, un, you know, happen in bits and pieces it probably was happening from the very beginning. I should be able to say something more definitive than probably because I've watched it so many times, but I feel like episode 14 is where it really starts happening. You really see each episode you watch silver get a little bit closer to this and a little bit Mm -hmm. closer to this and a little bit closer to this. And then it happens. And so I think as much as everyone knows, I love Flint and as much as you know, that reveal is like the thing I protect The thing I never Mm -hmm. spoil, that I never talk about so that people will be able to experience it the way I got to experience it the first time. I think for me, it's silver. I think for me, because it's the thing that kind of sneaks up on you, is that you Mm -hmm. think you know who he is. And then, and then he surprises you while he's surprising himself. Like, you know, yes. we talked about that last That's episode. That's really fun to watch, to see yeah. that look on his face. Where it's like, damn it, are you kidding me, Silver? <laughs> <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that might be it. It's, it's hard yeah. for me. It's really hard. But yeah. I did love just the watching him little by little get drawn into this place of responsibility mm-hmm. with, you know, all, 
all of the benefits and all of the belonging and all of the yeah. consequences that it end, he ended up paying for it. Gosh, what a cost. Yeah. Yep. What a cost. Yeah, he wasn't ready for that, huh? But and yet no. he took it. Well, it got him to quartermaster too, though. So yeah. <laughs> it, it it was a cost. But then that was that I mean, was not it, that was not actually his ambition, though. <laughs> it wasn't. No, that's that's true. Although to be someone who was important and needed, well, even that wasn't necessarily his ambition, was it? He just wanted. He didn't realize like it was. That's that's Flynn the writer Eugene Fitz. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Eugene Fitzherbert. Like I just right. want an island with money by myself. <laughs> Leave me alone. Right. Except except neither of them really want that when it except comes down to it. Except they don't really want that when it comes down yep. to it. Yep. Like any good hero. Right. Exactly. Okay. So the next thing I really wanted to talk about is we have these fascinating two characters. We have two characters from outside of the world, one at the beginning of the show, of the season, and one at the end of the season that really come in. And I feel like I, I've I want to talk, you know, having seen the whole season, I want to talk about their significance. We talked about each mm -hmm. of them separately. Um, and the first is Ned Lowe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, you know, he was not just like random badass pirate put in there to be badass. Mm -hmm. uh, and Abigail Ash, who was not random damsel in distress, put in there to be a damsel in distress. I think they both had really strong thematic importance. Yeah. Um, and before I ask you a question about the one thing I, I realized after we talked more about uh, about the last episode was that both of them talk about truth and honesty. Mm, that's very interesting. It is very interesting. So yeah. I, I had theories about Ned Lowe and now I'm now I'm I'm curious now what you all have to say. So let me just draw this out a little bit more. So Ned Lowe had his whole thing about do you remember his speech he gave to Eleanor? about how he was talking about other captains who use violence, yeah. but deep down they regret. And then he, and then he talked about how he's an honest captain. And then he used that as a way to tell her, you know, basically I have, I'm a sociopath. I don't really care. I'm yes. perfectly happy to use violence. And then Abigail Ash, we talked about more recently. We know where she stands, where it's that she was really, you know, searching for the truth of monsters and men. Mm -hmm. And then, and then called her father to task for his lack of honesty. Yeah. So I guess my first question is, do you all think these two are tied to each other? And if not, we'll talk about them separately. But I do want to talk mm -hmm. about both of them because I think they're important. But do you think there is some sort of t overarching tie between them? Um, I actually I think you can kind of consider them as far as season two goes, the angel and the devil on the shoulders of the show. If that makes Love sense. Ah, yep. Uh -huh. Totally. Uh, I like that. With Ned being like all the darkest parts of what a pirate can be, and mm -hmm. Abigail being the kind of shining beacon of what uncorrupt civilization can be, mm -hmm. and what a positive union between pirates and civilization could look like. Right. Love it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and Ned, I like that a and, whole lot. Right. Yeah. And Ned Lowe is the person who made us question like all the work we had done to get towards seeing pirates as men, not monsters. Men. He's the yeah, one who kind of... he was he's, definitely right. monstrous. Not that you right. couldn't have someone equally monstrous as him who was in society, who was, oh. you know, quote unquote, civilized. I mean, we've seen yeah. that too. Yes. But yeah, um, but yeah I mean... That that's why he was interesting to me initially was because we had gone through this whole process of of humanizing pirates and then he's like mm -hmm. yep guess what all that work you did tossing it yeah. out the window now um, yeah Lauren love it that's fabulous that's yeah, really really that's fabulous uh, and I just loved it because they were both outside the world and they both do they kind of both reframe your yeah. your ideas about pirates versus civilization good and evil and all of that yeah that's fascinating uh so yeah the next question i wanted to go to uh was i wanted to talk about um the ideas of evil that are that are shown here um uh, so we have ned Lowe, you know and then and again we have abigail's idea that she had of of the pirates being, you know, of men, good men who were, we we had almost kind possessed. of compared it to yeah. almost possessed, mm -hmm. and how this relates to Flint, because we have the running question throughout the whole show of who is, who is James Flint? Like, yes, mm -hmm. we did get his backstory here, so that was one, you know, that's a kind of very practical version of it, but we still have this question 
of who he is. Who is he really? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, you know, I I was saying in the last episode that he really had stopped being James McGraw and become James Flint. But Mm -hmm. up until then, we've talked about James McGraw, Dimples McGraw, drink. (laughs) Drink. (laughs) (laughs) I do miss Dimples McGraw, though. He was so sweet Um, and lovely. And clean so, shaven and just never, was, really. Yes, he was. Liz, you and the cleanliness. Cleanliness is a big deal for me. <laughs> Hiking is important. It's true. And, and yet and yet, you only talk about bathing Billy. You don't talk about ja- bathing Flint. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, since we're at the end of season two, and this isn't really a spoiler for people who haven't watched season three, because they've probably seen pictures, to say that Flint cuts his hair in season three, should we, yes. pour, should we pour one out or have a toast to his hair? Absolutely, we should. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. Take raise a, raise a red ponytail. Yeah, raise a glass. <laughs> so yeah, I really would love it if we came to some like, you know, I already said this, and maybe it was a spoiler, but I said it already, so I'll say it again. Is that in my eyes, you know, we now said goodbye to James McGraw, and maybe he'll yeah. re- resurface. But right now, you know, part of what happened um, with, you know, with these last few episodes when Miranda died and he decided he mm-hmm. would take on the mantle of monster. Uh, yeah. He is, he is 100% Flint right now. Um, but where do we place the relationship of these two sides, parts, you know, of these aspects of James? Like, do we think that Flint and McGraw were two halves of the same men? Do we see Flint as something that possessed McGraw? Do we see Flint as a story that McGraw told? Where where do you all see this? I would I just really I guess I mean I do have my own opinions, but I really want to hear your mm-hmm. opinions. Like where how do you feel like these two versions? I don't even does I feel like that's yeah. already kind of leading the question, but you know, these what is the relationship of McGraw and and Flint, the two Jameses or the two aspects of James? It reminds me of there's this Native American story or uh, almost like a proverb that talks about this grandfather who's walking with his grandson in the woods and they come across these two wolves that are fighting and the grandfather says that the the one wolf represents like all that is wicked and that is evil in the heart of man and that I think the white wolf represented all that is good and like kindness and generosity of spirit and the little boy said but which wolf will win? And the grandfather says, the one you feed, like the wolf you feed is the wolf who wins. And it's, that's always been something that, that has really stuck with me because I think that's what we see that that's happening here with Flint is that he had this idea that he could, we talked about it before, like put on Captain Flint, like a coat and take him Mm -hmm. off again. But that's the side of himself that he fed like that's the side of himself that he completely allowed to take over and then it did it got too strong like it it shifted his i i think it shifted the way he thought about things on his psychological level and i think it was also what you said about is it a story like because this show is very much about the power of storytelling yep. so yeah it's almost like he becomes the uh politician who believes his own lies Uh, like at first Mm -hmm. he you know at first he just starts telling himself the story and he's like okay I don't really believe it but it gets to him and it sinks in and it gets his claws in and it gets you know it gets to him so deeply that it kind of rewrites the story of James McGraw rewrites his old story um yeah I mean it's it's both of those versions work like Liz you're essentially saying the two halves and we definitely saw in the flashbacks when when um Right, Admiral like he Hennessy, always had... right? Yeah. Hennessy talks about that—that that he has this wild side and the darkness within him. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Ah, oh, this is a like, hard I don't one, think huh? That say say that Thomas Hamilton had decided to put on the mantle of Flint in order to try and do this thing, which I can't really imagine him doing. But let's say <laughs> that he had. Right. I don't think that it ultimately would have changed him in the same way that it changed James because it wasn't already a part of his character. Okay. So this is a new question then Mm -hmm. is James just really, really malleable because remember now I'm remembering something I said um, about him when, when Miranda was trying to convince him to, to stop this, 
this Nassau plan. And I had said she was trying to appeal to to James, the practical person, not the dreamer mm-hmm. that she had met. But he yeah. had become he had become intoxicated with with Thomas and become a dreamer and had set aside, you know, the side of him that was really concerned about practicality mm-hmm. all the time. Perhaps he's just perhaps he's a personality and maybe that's part of his strength. Like like Hennessy said that the yeah. wildness is part of what makes him a great leader. Maybe he's he's a really malleable person who can kind of rewrite his own story um depending on the circumstances around him. Like he became mm-hmm. he became a man of reason once he met Thomas. Right. And then when he Gosh, got that be- creeps me out. I got like goosebumps so that's, that's a scary kind of person <laughs> well flint is a scary kind of person i mean he i love is. him you know yeah. i love him but, but, but so he is a, a scary person. chameleon a little bit perhaps that's yeah. part of what's going on with him and maybe again you can see that as a weakness but on many levels that's also a strength sure no absolutely that can get you really far yeah. But it can be really dangerous if you go yes. too deep into whatever you're doing. And he did that with Especially Thomas. Especially if you don't have a really strong sense of self. Right. Which And he didn't have... What What was his background oh, in, stories? Uh, he like was the son, son of a carpenter. Son of a carpenter. <laughs> we know that for sure. <laughs> Uh, right. Well, that was the whole thing was that he wasn't he wasn't a person of wealth or, or status right. in in England because that's what the other officers used to taunt him. Right. So he was looking actively looking for a new identity anyway. Yeah, he was. I mean, that's so that and that's what the military offered him. Right. Mm-hmm. That's what the military offered a lot of men, men that could rise. I mean, a lot of men were just put into the military because they were younger sons of wealthy families. Right. But some men, if they were talented enough, could actually, like in Hamilton, could use the military as a way to raise I their have station. Made that part of the drinking game. <laughs> I know. Hamilton, Hamilton or Harry okay, Potter. Okay, we're just adding that. <laughs> Hamilton reference. Drink. Drink. I wanted to bring up um, pairs of characters that I feel like their their arcs are in relation to each other in this season. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we definitely can talk about Silver, and we've talked about Silver's arc quite a bit, actually, so far in this discussion. But I, maybe I'll bring us to that stage, because I really see that there, I feel like there are certain characters that their arcs really do have a relationship to each other. And so may, let's talk about Silver and Billy in relationship to each other. And I wanted to bring up um, when when Silver has Billy in chains, like hidden away in that hut right after he showed up. Oh uh, yeah. And, uh-huh. And, and that's when silver, well, first of all, Randall, I, you know, you know me, I always have to bring up right. Randall. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they have that thing where, where silver says his line about being liked is, is just as good as being feared or better than being feared. I don't yeah. remember what she says. And, and Randall yeah. says, liked we, is as good as feared, right? Liked as good as feared. And Randall says, we like mm-hmm. him. And then when silver, you know, kind of threatens Billy, Randall's like, we like him too. And back yeah. then you and I, Liz said that, you know, silver thought he was the one so liked, but then the next episode, when we see the crew greet Billy, we're like, no, that's what it is to truly be liked, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Billy was our kind of loyal, loyal pirate, and Silver was our scheming pirate or our stra- strategic pirate or right. strategic, not quite a pirate yet. Um, by the end of the season, we see Billy becoming increasingly strategic. Quite, yeah. Right? It's a little hot, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to go ahead and drink again. That yeah, was an you, adult you feeling. yeah, yeah, exactly. Liz, Liz gets to drink whenever we talk about Billy, um, and and then and Silver becomes truly liked. Like he thinks he's liked yeah. in the beginning, and it's funny because it's almost like he's you know he's signing his own doom away in a way, in a way. Yeah. Like he's saying this. He had gotten to be kind of tolerated at that point, mm-hmm. but by the end, he is also truly liked. Yeah. So I just thought this was interesting. Like, this is not a case where they're switching places. I think we have other ones, but they, but they're like going towards each other. Like, do you see? That's what I was just thinking. They go towards each other, like on this line. On uh, yeah, they absolutely do. And and this is part of a larger theory I have of like of everyone kind of becoming their truest selves. And this is, 
this oh, is much I like that. this is much clearer to me now that we know there's only four seasons. So like the mm-hmm. end of season two is the halfway mark. I mean, even though season one only had eight, eight episodes, but still, it's the halfway mark. And I think there's a kind of a beautiful symmetry um, of everyone by the at the halfway mark kind of reaching their truest selves. Does that make sense to both of you? Yeah, it totally does. Okay, so the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to always bring this back to Flint, even though I know I said that Silver is my favorite arc. So we have those two switching places. We have also, um, we have uh, Max and Eleanor switching places, right? Like, Oh, we do. Well, okay. Now I definitely see Max coming into Phil Eleanor's face and Eleanor's shoes, but how does yeah. Eleanor get closer to what Max is? Because she was taken away in chains. <gasps> oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think of it that way. Gosh. <laughs> um so we have a lot of switching places uh and then or coming towards each other so we but my favorite one is flint and vane yes (laughs) um so you know and this ties into the a lot of the things we've been talking about but like you know flint was our big picture person Mm -hmm. and vane was our immediate gratification and i was reminded of like the moment where flint was talking about this new plan and vane's like you know, give me my future. Can yeah. you know? In hand me room. my future mm-hmm. in this room. Oh, you can't. Okay, I'm not in. You know. Yeah. And how it's quickly? Just your words. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was cool. Um, mm-hmm. and so so it's really fascinating, and all of this works where all of these characters are kind of like becoming an Anne, obviously. You know, without yeah. any, you know, she is switching places a little bit with Max also, but but Anne's. I mean, she's the one who's just blossoming. She's become her yes. best self through Mm -hmm. her conflict with herself and her problems. So everyone leaves, everyone leaves the end of season two, you know, potentially in like the, well, except for Eleanor, whatever, Eleanor, I'm totally okay with her being carted off to England, but, um, (laughs) drink drink. on Eleanor. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say that's kind of her best place for the viewer. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. I remember also being like, oh, I'm 100% fine with this development. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. Yes, we all are. Um, no, no. I mean, I've got to take my usual place in in the world of, of criticism of Eleanor. And yes, it's actually true. I, I actually feel bad for her. <laughs> I know this is my role and I, I'm willing, yeah, I'm willing yeah. to take the heat for that. Um, mm-hmm. But the interesting thing is that everyone's growing and growing and growing and Flint was growing and growing and growing and then not, I mean, I, that's so, or for me, not yeah. like this for me, it's like he makes this shift at the very end where he just, he had done such great work of yes. integrating. Like we integrated the two sides of him because we learned about McGraw mm-hmm. and then he had integrated them. And it was this hard process when he sees Abigail, he has a hard time even introducing himself as McGraw and he, you know, he's kind of exposed the McGraw self to the pirates. Mm-hmm. And everyone else is doing all this growth and all this metamorphosis. And then Flint just, it's like a wall went down when Miranda died. Yeah. I'll, although, I mean, that's a metamorphosis too, isn't it? It's just yeah, it's still is growth. It's just not, right? Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah, maybe that's just my own feelings that I'm just so sad yeah. for James McGraw. But, it's, but it is interesting. I just felt like... Maybe what I'm feeling is like everyone's reaching greater potential is getting okay, in touch sure. with with, yeah. with with wider versions, why like more varied versions of themselves. Yes. Like Vane, Vane learned to think about we and be a strategic thinker in the long term. Mm-hmm. Like everyone's kind of incorporating new aspects of themselves. And Flint is the person who shut off part of himself at the very yeah. end when he says, "I will be your monster." Yeah, I was gonna he say just he did an about face. Um, personally his progression kind of stops in a way but his legend grows absolutely oh, yeah. yes That's absolutely point, too. right and we'll see how that relates to other characters in the second half i mean we've only seen half of the second half of of this show of the story but we'll see now what direction all of the characters start taking once we get into season three mm-hmm. but you're right 
I mean, he's the one who's going most quickly towards his legendary self, perhaps. Yeah. And now, I don't know if this is the right time to ask, but I actually have a question for you. Um, that final scene between Flint and Silver, um, mm-hmm. when Silver yeah. uh, kind of confesses about the gold, but like lies about it and blames yeah, yes, uh, that other guy. Yeah. No, he not so much confesses. Yeah, you mean. exactly. And right. Flint seems yeah. really upset. I have watched that scene so many times, and I still cannot, for the right. life of me, figure out... Do we think Flint is upset because he knows that Silver is lying and it was Silver um, or oh. not? Oh, it interesting. It sure looks like it to me. It sure it looks does. to me like he knows it's Silver, but mm-hmm. he needs Silver because Silver is Gates now and he knows it. Hmm. And so in a sense, then that would be a moment of growth for him to not immediately murder Silver. <laughs> <laughs> <And not laughs> immediately true. be That's like, totally uh, true. Totally like true. Infected. Sorry, guys. <laughs> right. But yeah, the show never really makes oh, it wait, clear. Oh, wait, I killed another yeah. one of my quartermasters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can't do that. <laughs> this one only lasted a few I, hours. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think you're right, Lauren. I don't think there's any way that Flint does not, the, at very least, highly suspect silver oh and i love that it's too sneaky it's right. just too devious right although right, i don't right. know and because he... the, I, I'm so, okay there is a follow-up to this moment in season three and yep. it never makes it clear whether in season nope. two he knows or not so that's right i vaguely remember the follow-up now yeah, yeah. there is there is I, a follow-up i think the suspicion is very strong because How could it's it not too smart be? not to suspect yeah right he knows who I silver is. I mean, that's is. a total silver move. And and probably there also is a little bit of respect for the fact that Silver did tell him right then because he's like, you need to know what you're sailing into and what we're, what you're going home to. Right. So. No, I that totally it's... works. That, that works way better than any other explanation because I, I, last episode I was like, why is he so upset about some like random scout betraying mm-hmm. them? But no, I saw it the, as when he was like, right when I was trusting you, like, this is what you do to me. Yes. I thought, yeah, like, I think he was mad at Silver and he was mad at himself for being bested. Yeah. 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 That's a good Absolutely. point, too. I like that. No, that all makes sense. I like that very much. And the, yeah, that is, that's a great way to look at it. And it definitely is very relevant to a lot of what's going to happen in the next season. Mm-hmm. So that's fabulous. Okay, ladies, so we talked about a lot about Flint. We talked about Billy. We talked about Silver. We talked about Billy and Silver in relation to each other. And my biggest question is, at the end of this season, whose crew is this? We had a lot of people say this. Like we had when Max, when Silver said, talk to Max about yeah. Flint's crew. And she said, aren't you part of his crew? Aren't and you? then we yeah. had, <laughs> yeah. And then we had mm. Billy when he was talking to Dufresne talk about how he doesn't want people who aren't going to fu- who are going to betray his brothers. He doesn't right. want them on my crew. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, we have Silver saying my crew. So at the end of this season, when we see all these different versions of leadership uh, and Liz had brought up, I think, last episode or the episode. So before the comparison between a patriarchal view of leadership versus a fraternity. Right. Yeah. This paternal versus fraternal. Uh Uh-huh. Whose crew is it? Whose crew is it right now? Well, it's doubly interesting, too, because, boy, they were all really doubting Flint on this whole mission of just sailing into Charlestown. Of course, I'm sure they got pretty excited when they decided to just blow the shit out of it. That was much more piratish than all going in here for reconciliation. But even reconciliation was really only sold to them by Silver. Silver was the one there on the beach that said, hey, maybe we can be men again. Mm. It's, it, you know, but I, I think that's also why it's so interesting because Billy was there sitting saying, you've got eight votes now. You've got however many votes. Like these things, they just change. They change a lot. Uh, and I think... Those shifting sands, absolutely. Um, I think they're Flint's in name, and uh, that that sounds like not much, but I mean, basically, no, it's they, a lot. They, yeah, it's exactly, a lot. it's a lot. They wouldn't be able to do what they're doing and pirate the way they're pirating if yeah. they did not have Flint's name, like sailing well, we under the name. We saw that of... with Dufresne. We saw that with the situation with Dufresne. Exactly. Exactly. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Nobody would surrender to Captain Billy Bones, and nobody would surrender yet to Captain 
silver. So yeah, uh-huh. yeah. So they're Flint's in name. Uh, yeah, Billy's kind of the glue that holds them together in terms of just like the warm fuzzy one. He's the closest the show gets to warm and fuzzy, kind of. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and silver. Uh, I, d- I did this like kind of silly one of my write ups for season three. I did this thing where I compared uh, some of the characters to Shakespearean characters because I do really see Flint cool. as like a Macbeth oh, yeah. figure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I didn't. I don't think I mentioned Silver in that, but Silver is kind of an Iago figure. Not that he's evil, but he mm-hmm. they have his ear or he, he has their ears. Yes, and he's right. a very mm-hmm. he's a very seductive voice, like. Yes. What he whispers, they will do his bidding. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so he's kind of, yeah, so basically that's kind of a cop-out answer that they are, their crews in all these different ways, but that's kind of what makes this crew what it is. Wait, are they a power trio now? Kind of. <gasps> they are kind of. We do have three threesomes. Oh, we man. have three threesomes. Oh my God, I did not think about this. Wait, wait, let's put this together. So wait. Okay. So now Flint would be... Who would be what in the power trio? Okay, we need a pathos, a logos, and an ethos. Ethos has got to be our... Oh, gosh, this is hard. But but ethos has to be Billy. He's the only one with like any kind of moral center at all. <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, then... N- right? I'm not sure. I think Billy might be our, our pathos, actually, at this stage. Because he's the one who has their hearts. He's the one who, who their that, emotions that are true. tied he is to. the heart of it. And then Silver, oh, wow. That's Has hard. Has Flint become our Logos? Because he he's now kind of taken, he's the one, he's the man of reason now. I mean, even though he's, you know, batshit crazy half the time. But <laughs> he might be our man of that. reason. And maybe Silver is our ethos. Because he's the one who can take the two of them and bring them forward to a goal. Oh, I don't know. Okay, I'm not sure if that works know. at all. Yeah, we're all, I don't know. We're going to have to think about that now. Okay, but that will bring us to the question of power trios. I do want to bring us back to this. And okay. again, I have to thank Alistair Stevens from Story Wonk for helping me with this whole concept. Mm-hmm. But I did That's bring this up. That's what we usually drink for saying Story Wonk. Yeah, so I know. Seriously, Sorry, Story you, Wonk, ladies. drink. Yeah, drink. <laughs> also, you realize by calling Flint and uh, Silver and Billy a power trio, you can practically hear the, th- the sound of a thousand fan fictions being written right now. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> this is true. true. <laughs> All right. Now we're toasting to you, our uh, our our silver flint people and our is it Billy Flint? Our Flint Flint Bones, Flint Billy people. You uh, have to come up with another couple <laughs> name for for all of them. Bones? Flint Bones who now? Wait, what now? <laughs> last time we talked about things that uh fans disagree on, which last time was Eleanor. And this time, the kind of main season two thing that I've seen around, like, fan forums and whatever um, is, uh, do you think, because we, we do get a lot of female and female sex scenes, do you think the show should have given us a male and male sex scene for the uh, Flint and Thomas? Do you think, like, the show uh, kind of did a disservice to that relationship and not? What, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? I have very strong thoughts. Liz, do you have thoughts on that? Because I will definitely go my, into my you, speech You go it. ahead with your strong thoughts. With your strong thoughts, and because I'm interested to hear. Okay, well, my feelings about it is, you know, personally, sure, I would have loved to have seen that because, you know, those men are lovely and that would have been really fun. (laughs) Drink. But, (laughs) all right, adult feelings. Um, But ultimately, I think this goes back to what I said about how beautifully and differently their the the snippets we get of their time together is in a completely different visual language than everything right. we see in NASA that we see them in the visual language of romance of like you know a yeah. proper like romantic period, idealism peri- mm-hmm. right period drama like romantic interactions with the soft light and the smiling and the cleanliness Liz and mm-hmm. you know and it's just and that I just feel like it's a really beautiful thing that that the that the couple the gay couple that had become kind of the thing that civilization pointed their you know its ire at and its you know and its destructiveness towards is presented in these in a different kind of visual and story language 
that of like of just full on romance without mm-hmm. any of the grittiness of the reality and of sex like all of the other sex we see is so so literal it's so just you know bodies being naked with each other and doing things that people do in real life with sex and their romance was was uh was framed in this very different kind of very flowery way and yeah. i think that 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 seems to me very deliberate and i i think that's really mm-hmm. saying something i think they could have done that with a sex scene too though like they could have done i i'm thinking of those like uh the the fade in and outs the fade to blacks that were in the otherwise pretty awful movie cold mountain but I remember thinking that that, <laughs> that that's, do you remember that movie? But yes, I remember I thinking that this, that the sex scene at the end was very beautiful, basically. I don't know. Very ro- romantic with that capital R um, and not literal, not graphic in, in other ways. Um, so I think that they could have done that. And I, I have not thought about it before, but I can certainly see where it does their relationship and and particularly to a gay man or a gay couple watching the show i would i could see where they would feel like it does them a disservice to say mm-hmm. why is this not as acceptable or as hot or as whatever it is as getting to see you know everybody gets so excited about girl on girl you know what i mean mm-hmm. and also no, as a absolutely. woman I feel that it's kind of, if they're not going to show both sides, maybe that does feel a little demeaning, actually. Like, I wouldn't have thought of it before, but yeah, but but why is girl on girl still hot for everybody, but guy on guy, no, that's too far. Dial it back. Like, do you think, Lauren, what do you think? Do you think this was a deliberate choice they made because they were uncomfortable? I mean, I feel like this is a show that does not shy away from from, from you know every variety of se- of sexuality i was gonna say I, I don't really have an answer i honestly see both sides like like liz just said mm-hmm. i totally see why fans are kind of annoyed by this um and honestly part of the reason i was so relieved and impressed by the reveal in episode five that flint is gay was not only because that's so bold for a show to make the leading man gay like of course yeah. plenty or you know bisexual or you know Whatever, not heterosexual, whatever he is. Right, yeah. Um, not a straight uh, white dude, yeah. Yes, exactly, because I, I really can't think of another show that isn't overtly, as we say, a gay show, which is to say right. centered around gay life and gay themes mm-hmm. um, that has a character like this. So I was like, wow, that's so interesting and so bold, because that's not even the point of the show, it's just kind of nonchalance. Um, and part of me was also, I have to say, really relieved because, as we've mentioned, the hardest sell on this show is Michael Bay's name. We're like, oh, I don't want to watch a Michael Bay show. Oh, right. um, yeah. Uh-huh. And season one's emphasis on girl on girl stuff did feel a little bit like the super heterosexual, c- catering to a heterosexual male viewer yeah. who is the kind of viewer who likes Michael Bay's work. And obviously, we are not that demographic. We, right. you know. Um, so the, all the girl and girl stuff in season one and the fact that it had no guy on guy stuff made me yeah. a little bit nervous because there is the pop culture tendency to fetishize girl on girl stuff. Yeah, um, right. And so I, I was very relieved in season two. I was like, okay, the, the girl and girl stuff wasn't fetishizing it. Like this is really exploring these themes in a sensitive way. Right. Um, but as you said, the lack of showing the guy on guy stuff as much as it shows the girl and girl stuff, I totally see why people are annoyed. Um, and yeah, I do see their point. But like Daphne said, I also do like that interpretation as it's the language of romance. Um, and I do think mm-hmm. that's probably what the writers were going for. Um, yeah, it's definitely kind of like the Eleanor thing in season one. It's definitely a complicated issue. And I see both sides of fans who agree and fans who don't agree. Hmm. That's an interesting question. I would like to hear from our listeners on that one. I Yeah, I've just, I, I guess I'm just, I'm very tied to my own view of it. I really... I don't feel like this I don't feel like this or any show has um has an obligation to to show things one way or the other. I feel like I do feel like, you know, our major our major gay relationship our two major gay relationships are Max and Anne and Max and Anne we do we do uh we do see them having sex obviously. Mm-hmm. Um 
And I think that that's also done very respectfully. Like, I do think that it's appropriate. It's appropriate for them to have shown them actually having sex because the source of them having sex started as a thing about the fact that Anne actually, um, actually wants to have sex with a woman, not necessarily Mm -hmm. with Max. Like their relationship doesn't start as a relationship of love. It Mm -hmm. starts as a way for Anne to experience sexuality in a different Mm way. Whereas James and Thomas is a relationship that starts from love and, and the, and the romantic relationship comes after, after the partnership that is so deep had started already. I just, so like part of me, like the political part of me wants that to be shown and Mm -hmm. the story loving part of me loves the way it was done. Does that make sense? It does. Although I still think for a show that has a fair bit of sex and all of it, or let me put it this way, none of it pretty. We have not seen any right. pretty sex yep. to give us the pretty sex in that romantic language that you were talking about. Yeah, with that would have James been great. Thomas as the one true love would have been pretty great. Yeah, yeah it I would think- have been pretty great. Mm-hmm. It would have definitely yes. There definitely would have been a way for them to do that and make it still fit into this classification that I yeah. have set of like, of like not you know not necessarily romantic love and romantic love. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That but would also, have been nice. Uh, the, to go with what you said, the part of me that uh, that agrees with you on kind of the story level, um, I actually disagree a little bit on uh, like yes, the show does have a lot of sex, but. I actually, I don't think there are any sex scenes that do not relate to the plot or the characters. Right, yeah. Um, like, even that scene that you all hate with, uh, in episode one with uh, Silver and the... The black scene. Oh, yeah, that one. Yeah. Yep. Um, like, even that scene is relevant in that well, we didn't really see any of the sex. We just saw the immediately before and the immediately after. Right. And right. that sure. informed us of his character in that he is a guy who is surrounded by five women and, like, is only caring about <laughs> <laughs> this right. other uh-huh. thing. <laughs> so true. The, like, yeah. something that would give him money. Yeah. It's so mm. true. <laughs> um, and like Vane and Eleanor, that's important to inform us of their dynamic. Jack and yeah. Anne, the same. That's really important to inform Absolutely. us of their, their dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, same with Flint and uh, Miranda. And I guess I'm trying to think. Uh, so I guess it's kind of appropriate to feel like Flint is a guy who would kind of um, like kind of yank the curtains closed. Like he doesn't want the audience to see oh, him in that way. Oh, uh-huh. um, I love that. Yeah, that's actually a great interpretation of it. Yeah, like so that kind of makes sense to me for his character, I guess. Um, although I don't know, like you said, they, maybe they could have done it in a way that suited the scene. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, even even had they shown like the beginning. I mean, they show. I mean, the, again, I I made it clear. I love I love that montage where you see yeah. the inti- the intimate moments between James and Thomas that are. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I mean, they're not not sexual. I mean, they're they are in a bed. I mean, and you yeah, know. but even had they not been clothed and just had like the sheet over them and it had like this kind of post coital afterglow thing, I think that still would have done a little bit more to, um, I I don't know t- to be more inclusive. Yep. No, no, you're right. Totally right. Yes, there would have been a way to do that and still have this be about a different language, uh, a yeah. different visual language of love. So we didn't end up talking about whether Max and uh, about whether Max really loved Eleanor. A part of me has never been able to understand Max and Eleanor's relationship because it doesn't really make sense with what we know of Max in that um, when she and Eleanor were together, um, Eleanor was paying her, as we said. And so Eleanor Mm -hmm. was technically her John. And Mm -hmm. that is bad business for a whore to become emotionally attached to a John. Um, sure. And that's like not really smart. And that kind of counters what we know of Max. That's why I've always been very confused by the relationship. Um, Mm -hmm. See, for me, this totally works with Max because I, I, I will always stand by this idea that, again, I really see Max as this fantastic and fascinating integration of different character types. And I'm going to compare it to Silver. Let's, let's say, okay, we've watched Silver have this arc where like he was totally, you know, Mr. Grifter, loner, whatever, all in it for himself, right? So we were pretty Mm -hmm. clear on that about Silver. 
And then we watched him have this progression towards caring about his crew, about actually losing his leg because of his crew. And we know, like, you could you could say with Silver in the last episode that he didn't want to he didn't want to to sacrifice members of the crew. But and then he starts losing his leg, you know, then he starts getting that axe to his leg. But we know that his his conviction was firm because at the end of that is when he says his line about, you know, does he know where his, where his keys are and has he seen them since he left my crew? Like mm-hmm. at the end of that, he's talking about his crew. And so we saw him, we saw Silver, you know, have this arc and it's fascinating and I love it. I feel like those two halves were always integrated in Max. Max is the person that Silver maybe has become now that yes, She's definitely, now that I understand that, definitely a Slytherin. No question. <laughs> drink. Oh, wait. Oh, no, you drink, didn't make indeed. Harry Potter one of them. No, we did. Yeah, whatever. We said drink. Hamilton and Harry Potter. Those are okay. the drink. Ones, so why not? Nerdiest podcast ever. Um, yeah. Nerdiest podcast about pirates. I love that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I truly believe that Max has always had this integration. And again, we can't talk about season three, but she's going to prove it. But I think she's already proved it. I think that Max has always been a person who, you know, sees all the angles, is a serious strategist, knows how to read people, all of the things that Silver has. But she also is a person who has sought community. She just has been Mm. less successful at finding it. But I think that Max is a person who loves deeply. I really do. I, I, I'm I, just going to have to always stick with this as much as people argue with me about it. I think that Max loved Eleanor. I think that Max I think she learns to love Anne. I think that she, mm-hmm. you know, it's not just loyalty. I mean, she definitely has loyalty to Anne. But I think it goes beyond that. I do think that Max, in my eyes, is kind of the holist person of all of the people. Because in this dichotomy that we have between between people who are strategic thinkers and people who are emotional thinkers, I think she's actually both and possibly the best at both. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I stand by it. <laughs> I do think it's at least written. I do think it's at least the writer's intent that Eleanor... Or, or rather, that Max loved Eleanor, especially right. with that first scene where she's saying that let's run away together, and she's so upset and she cries on the floor. Exactly, like she's, she absolutely loves Eleanor. Well, and now and she, how and she long doesn't she leave. Loves she doesn't leave because of Eleanor. Like that whole thing about you know yeah. she's she, yeah. Sorry, she ends up being you know she ends up being taken by the Ranger crew because of Eleanor, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and then we had talked about in, in that last episode where she saw the hanging effigy of Eleanor, like how much she was worried for Eleanor and how much she was worried for herself. And I, I don't think it's quite clear yet. Like, I think that she finds any residual feelings she has for Eleanor as being highly inconvenient and foolhardy, but that doesn't mm-hmm. mean that they're not there still. And it's one of the things that this show does so well also is just showing you how highly inconvenient love tends to be anyway yes for all of our characters. absolutely like no absolutely. one is happily in love in this show no that's true <laughs> no i think that everything she's done is in relation to eleanor she loved eleanor so she did what she did because she loved eleanor at the end of season one she you know she she starts her rise and she they have that little conversation on that bridge and everything she's doing she's doing as a show to eleanor she's saying you know, now I have people, now yeah. I have this. It's so it's so blatant that part of what she's doing is saying, look, I'm, 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 I, you know, I'm over you. You know, that whole yeah. thing where you're mm-hmm. like, you protest too much. Like she's like, right. yeah. she's so busy showing Eleanor that she's, that she's over her. Um, and, and then we have in the last episode when, when Fraser asks her, why this place? Why are you willing to offer more money for this place? And she doesn't answer, but she, she you know, she, yeah. she pauses, right, she pauses, right. she has that, that moment. Mm-hmm. I just, I really think that some part of her 
is so in love with Eleanor through all of this that she, yeah. you know, and then there's that conversation God, with that Vane. Sucks. Sorry about your life, Max, man. Yeah, seriously. Um, yeah. There's that conversation with Vane where she says to Vane, you know, I've learned, I've learned how to, for, you know, how to not be in love with her or whatever she says. And he's like, not interested but she's still talking about that. Like she's yep. still talking about how saying. to deal with your love for Eleanor. Yeah. See, that's what I actually, I see Vane as the person who's the wholest in terms of loving deeply. And by the end of season two, also thinking strategically, like right. certainly not uh-huh. thinking strategically before that, but I think it was more the, as I said, when he said that line, I suggest we get him the hell out of there. That line mm-hmm. blew me away also because no other character would do that, would risk your life for someone you yep. don't even like. Uh, yeah, like uh, Max wouldn't yeah, do that. Yeah. Max would not do that. Silver would not do that. Eleanor would not do that. Jack would not do that. Nobody, nobody would do that. That's why I was like, holy right. shit, Charles even Bill, Vane, who even are Billy you? wasn't right. Even <laughs> yeah. Billy wasn't really doing that. Yeah, yeah. that's what. Yeah, that's well, why. Yeah, I do. Like well, Charles and that's Vane. something. Yeah, and but again, I loved him that, from the beginning, so it's hard for me yeah, to try to Liz think about. Yeah, Liz is the like, one of us who loved him from the beginning. No, I immediately was just like, "This guy, I like this guy." Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I love him now. That, but that's right. what made me love him because I was like, "Who else would do that?" This is such a unique, mm-hmm. interesting thing to do. Yeah. But you see, I, I see, I see. This is we've said many times through the show. We've ended up comparing Max and Vane, and I gotta say, like, yes. Vane, what did we say? Vane is a Gryffindor? Is that what we said? Vane is a Gryffindor. <laughs> yes. and no, Vane like, is Ma- Max would yes. not risk her life to Drink save someone she does not even like. She would not do that. Well, except she did with Anne. Oh, okay, she likes Anne. That's what yeah, you're saying. She likes Anne. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that's true. But we have made so many comparisons Plus with Vane and Max. Right, that's true. But we've made so many comparisons throughout with Max and Vane. I mean, it also, we, you know, we jokingly said that, you know, Eleanor has a type. I think you said that, Liz. Eleanor has a type. Um, and, <laughs> and, but I think that actually sometimes comes to this thing about gender is that, you know, is that we don't know what Max would do in that situation because we don't, Max doesn't have the power that Vane has, the, you yeah. know, just the power of, of actually being a pirate, of being a badass pirate, a proper pirate. Drink. <laughs> Drink. <laughs> Indeed, proper pirates. Um, so I actually am going to argue that, that Max and Vane are more similar, especially at this moment in Vane's development, than, than a lot of people give her credit for. And, you know, he's, he's the guy who can go do that. She can't actually go do that. Anne can go do that, and that's why she's my favorite lady. <laughs> exactly. Anne, Anne is a proper could pirate. Anne could right. totally go do that, yeah. Right. Okay, so we've established that Lauren likes proper pirates. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I guess, no, the thing that has always frustrated me about Max is that I totally see the comparison to Silver, but maybe this is, as you said, a gender thing. Um, he always has an interesting payoff for his schemes. Like, that's a really interesting payoff, like the leg thing. Um, and the accidentally manipulating the one crew member into, cr- into killing another crew member. And whereas Max's payoff is not something that directly relates to Max, like the payoff is then, you know, Jack getting his crew, but then that's right. Jack's moment. That's not Max's moment. Um, yeah. And so sometimes I'm like, oh, like I feel like I would like Max more if she had those really satisfying payoffs. And I don't know if that's the thing that the writers are doing or if that's just her gender and her place in this world. Um, See, it's funny. I actually like Max more for the fact that her machinations create payoffs for other people. Her machinations, her max- if you will. <laughs> I'm sorry. I drank too much scotch. <laughs> <laughs> That's my fault, everyone. I bought Liz Scotch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's funny. I mean, that actually, for me, that, that really is something I love about Max is that what did she do all of season two? She got she got what she needed. You know, she needed security. She needed, she needed a coalition. But she got it yeah. by giving other people what they needed. And I love that well, about and her. Becoming the madam, I think, was a really big moment for her. But I also thought, I mean, season two ended with her face like a glow oh, with the glinting so of true. gold. That's too. so true. She did in the end get what she so needed. That, that was a pretty big win for her. Yeah. 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 But she, see, she, she needed Jack shiny. to do that. Um, like she, she did could need not. Jack to do whereas that, I point. love Anne because 
I guess all the women in this show are an exploration of really what it means to be a woman in a man's world. But to me, Anne mm-hmm. is the most interesting exploration of that. Because, like, when she says, I'll never be your wife, but we'll be together till they put us in the fucking ground. Like, basically, she, mm-hmm. she doesn't need a man. She is choosing to have one, though. Uh, whereas Max uh-huh. and Eleanor That's don't good. really choose. They just, they need men to accomplish what they, they are them. doing. Right. And can just go do whatever mm-hmm. she wants. But she well, chooses, and that's an interesting choice that she no, makes. But, but Anne reaches that point. Like, she made it very clear that actually what was her problem up until then was that she hadn't defined herself. That she did always define herself through Jack because he saved her. And, um, I, see, I, I see that as more like... Anne reaching that point more than Anne starting out at the point. Like, yes, she can kill people, right? We know this. But <laughs> like, but in the beginning of the show, Anne is the person of all of our main characters that I think is least in touch with her own self and in control of herself. Like, yes, she can take control of a of a violent situation. Yeah. But she's not actually well, and- in control of her own her own identity, her own destiny, her own and that's something she learns. And and learns right. partly through her relationship with Max, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that she was perceived as very competent, um, but but probably she never was. I mean, she said it herself that she was never perceived as autonomous or as independent. And I don't think that she perceived herself as such either until that moment on the bow of the ship where she did realize that she had a choice to make. Right. And she could walk away from Jack to, like, forge her own way. Or she could stick with him just because she wanted to be with him. Just because... Because they're two halves. Yeah. 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 Well, and I mean, I wouldn't even say that because they're two halves, but because she... I mean... Because they were partners, because she chose his partnership. Like Lauren was saying, like, she chooses Jack, even when their relationship changes completely. Mm -hmm. But I see what you're saying about how, like, in her mind, she is seen now, with the benefit of hindsight, that it was need that kept her with him for all that time. And now she's gotten to a point where she doesn't feel that she needs him anymore, but she still wants him she chooses him to have this part of her life which is very insightful lauren yeah well that's that's interesting and it also is unexpected since she is such a brutal character and that's what makes her so interesting to me at Mm -hmm. least absolutely yeah she's she i mean yeah i was gonna say to me vane and max are a lot alike in that way and that they're both very outwardly brutal and kind of coarse and not the cerebral characters but there's a lot more beneath the surface than what you would think Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. i like that because it would have been easier for her to just say, fuck you, Jack. You know, and, walk away. <laughs> and she definitely and says him, that many times. Really. <laughs> oh, sure. But I mean, like, she could blame him for the position in which she found herself where her name was attached to his. Mm-hmm. She could blame him for her lack of identity. She could blame him for not having found this part of herself and her sexuality and her autonomy because of, you know, being cleaved to this other person. But she doesn't. She she ad- she takes that for herself to say, you know, this was a mistake that I made for not knowing who I am, but I know now, and then reconciling things with Jack the best that she can. It's a very strong character moment. Yeah, and frankly, it, really uh, it would have been easy for the writers to make her not one dimensional, but just you know, kind of a warrior woman character who is mm-hmm. not necessarily yeah. that complex. And so that's why I love her season two arc so much is because she's a really fierce warrior woman, but she's also allowed to be really vulnerable and she also chooses yes. to have this relationship. And so that's what made me, because mm-hmm. we, we were talking about in season one, like at the beginning, I did think the writers, I was like, I don't know how good you are at woman. But then in season two, in season two, I was yes. like, okay, you can write woman. Like Anne is yep. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. No. And, and the thing that's, I think the thing that's most incredible, incredible about her and this again ties her to flint is that she manages to be completely vulnerable at the same moment that she's being completely brutal when she's when she kills charlotte and logan that is you know complete break for her oh yeah and that is very much like when that's very much like when flint kills gates is that we see these people being so brutal 
and that's when we most feel for them. That's when we most see that their that yeah. their personality and also is breaking off apart. To Bear McCreary because his the the underscores that he does yeah. for those scenes, no question, are just extraordinary. yeah. They just put yeah. us in the place we need to be emotionally. Yeah, and you know what? I will give Eleanor one. The scene where I have <laughs> still to this date sympathized the most with Eleanor, and I still think is her best character moment, and probably will be her best character moment on the show. Is when she's on the other side of that yep. gate betraying Vane. Yeah. Oh, it's incredible, isn't and it? And she has tears in her eyes. I was like, wow, yes, okay, Eleanor. Like, that is a moment. <laughs> I, I had been waiting for that moment. To, yeah, and so right. that is yeah. her best moment. And yeah, It is absolutely her best moment. It truly is, by far. I Because she's yeah, doing I a think... terrible thing, and yet you do feel for her, and you do understand why she's doing it. Right. right. Well, mm-hmm. and I think this is this gets down to what, possibly all three of us love so much about this show is that nothing is simple and this show shines at exactly those moments when you see a million facets to one one scene one behavior one choice Mm -hmm. that a character makes is that I just I feel like I've never seen that level of complexity in characters in in a tv show to be honest, or possibly a movie. Yeah. I, I just feel like it is those moments and every character has them and they're just, and there's so many of them where they're, you, you just see like, what we humans go through. Like what we, we don't make easy yeah. choices. We don't have moments where everything's clear and we know exactly what to do with ourselves. And yes, it's very mm-hmm. heightened because it's pirates and it's fiction <laughs> and all of that. Right. But it really is I th- I think that's why people love this show so much is that you see these moments where where you're betraying the person you love most or you know doing something that's like the worst thing you could do but you're doing it for the best yeah. of reasons or at least you think yes. so and this really is just a heightened version of what all of us go through. Yeah. I mean it sounds really corny but I don't know that I could have asked for a divorce without this show. That's amazing. Because it allowed me space to be more complicated than I had allowed myself to be. Yeah, I think it does. I think it, it celebrates. It celebrates how complicated we are. Yeah. And that's an amazing, an amazing thing. Even with the awful consequences that come with it, which sometimes do. Yeah, you know, absolutely. There, there's something to be said for just, you know, keeping calm and carrying on and smiling and passing the tea. Yeah. But- yeah. Yeah. It's not for everybody. Maybe that is. Maybe that's maybe that is like I've been asking ever since I fell in love with his show. I've been asking the question of why we love tragic heroes. And maybe that's why. Maybe because they are just heightened versions of what we actually go through on a day to day basis. Hmm, That's possible. They hold the mirror up to nature. Yep. Absolutely. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, like I told you I got sucked into the show when I had back surgery when I was. Right. You right. know, and th- I, I wrote an article about it that was circulating around a while ago. Um, but yeah, yes, no, everyone but in should case... read that article. It's really <laughs> fantastic. But uh, in case anyone Link thinks that makes me biased about this show, in that article, I also wrote about uh, I got into the show Sons of Anarchy. And I can totally admit yeah. the later seasons of that show, total shit, the final season. So I am not biased oh, yeah. about Black Sails. <laughs> 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 um, right. Yeah, no, like, I got into that show when I was, you know, in a lot of physical pain and just, like, really lonely and not feeling much motivation Mm -hmm. in life. And, yeah, really kind of, I guess, entertainment can get you through really rough times in your life. Um, Yeah, Yeah. and I guess this show maybe more than others because it is one of the most human shows on TV, if not Mm -hmm. the most. Well, and storytelling is powerful. I mean, this is something that is a theme of the show, but it is actually a theme of humans is that storytelling is very important to us. There's something just so essential about us that we Mm -hmm. that we experience. We learn about ourselves through storytelling. There's no question. Yeah. And I mean, season two is just like one of the most outstanding seasons of television in existence. No question. Yeah. No question. Yeah. I agree. Like I really, really do. I don't really have zero criticisms about it, except perhaps for that thing we debated, should the Flint and Thomas thing have been a sex scene. But even yeah. that's not like a huge oh. criticism. It's just like no. an interesting. No, it's really not. That's, that's it's like an inter- a, yeah, it's yeah. an interesting thing to debate. Um, mm-hmm. Right. Because it's not like they got it wrong. They could have gone farther, but it's not like they had all got it wrong. Right. I think actually they got it right. totally right. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's true. This is, this is phenomenal. We love the show. Clearly. All three of us clearly love this show (laughs) very much. (laughs) 
Um, all right. I think uh, I feel like we've really covered this beautiful, beautiful season. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, this has been such a great discussion. Lauren, I'm going to see you mm-hmm. in a few days because we're both going to be at New York Comic Con. Uh. And Liz will not. <laughs> Sorry, Liz. We are going to do, uh, I th- I'm assuming that both of us in our, me here and in our Twitter and Lauren on Inverse, we're going to do our very best to share this experience with everyone. Mm-hmm. Um. And uh, we will put a link. Lauren, is would you like us to put a, a link? Well, we'll put a link to your whole profile like we did last time, but maybe we'll put a link to Lauren's uh, article about your surgery. To that and, article. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. It's a really terrific article, and everyone should read it. Um, and, um, oh, and next week, we we are actually recording this before we did our usual thesis statement game. So... We will we will talk about the winners for that when we do the first episode of season three. Although Liz does have a Sounds pirate, good. we do have a special pirate name today. Uh, we, we do have a special pirate name. We do. We have um, we have a voicemail line now, which started as a joke, just like this podcast. It started as a joke uh-huh. and became really? a real thing. I should always make yes, jokes. we do. <laughs> I should joke about a million dollars. It's totally true. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So our voicemail line for anyone who wants to leave us a message is area code 405-67-FLINT. No joke. <laughs> it is actually 67-FLINT. I love it. We have So exciting. We have two people who have left us messages so far. We're waiting for the rest of you. And as mm-hmm. our very first voicemailer, Janine, gets a pirate name. What is it, Liz? She does. Okay, well, I have combined a sailing term with a Baroque art name just for you, Janine, since the two-part voicemail, I might add, was brilliantly insightful and about Baroque art and the style of black sails. So, Janine, your pirate name is Lugsail Lorenzo. (laughs) That's fabulous. I really like it. Yeah, I never, I, I never asked, how do you guys come up with the pirate names? Do you just do it off the top of your head, or does this take some meditation, maybe? This is all Liz. Most of the time, it's the top of my head, actually. Um, and then I, it takes just, I like alliteration, so I usually kind of think about that. And, like, this time I wanted an L word. I'll, yeah, I just, I, I did a quick Google search for Baroque artist names and then sailing terms, and then I just stuck two together that I really liked. So <laughs> it's usually pretty quick. It's yeah, it doesn't take me very long. And you manage not to harass Janine's husband by using the name Walrus in it because <laughs> I love your no, aggravation no, no. about the name Walrus. It amuses me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, drink! We named the Walrus. Drink, finally, drink. Oh. We, oh, that was the first time we actually <laughs> named a ship, right? We didn't actually name ships. Yeah. Oh wait, speaking of ships, I do. I do have one last question. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Actually, th- this might be actually my one spot of criticism for season two. One thing. How the fuck does Vane get to Charleston? Does oh. he apparate? <laughs> does he teleport? <laughs> Come on. He just... <laughs> Charles Vane can get on any ship he wants to get on, right? I mean, he's got his crazy... Oh, what do you call him? Dreadlocks Pirate <laughs> Guild... No, I mean, I've, like, convinced him, myself just... they took longboats or something, but, like, part of me, because the thing that he I was annoyed about in his season He's one storyline was that it made him borderline magical with the whole resurrection thing, <laughs> which kind of violated <laughs> the laws true. of this world, because this is not wait, a magical wait, wait. world. Lauren, Lauren, Vane, totally magical. He is, he is our pirate <laughs> yeah, so unicorn. I was like, please tell me this is not a magical <laughs> Charles Vane moment. No, like, he's interesting enough on his own when he's no, not no, being magical. I, I have an actual answer. I, and I have to say that Lauren and I have actually talked about this before. And I've come up with an answer. Okay. The answer isn't so much technically how he does it. He does it somehow. But in a <laughs> storytelling... No, I mean, again, there's lots of boats. Like, they have boats. They find boats. But from a storytelling perspective, how boring would it have been had we gone from like them in the fort and not knowing whether he was being killed by his crew or not to us actually seeing them boarding boats and getting there we had to see it the way we saw it because it was so beautiful to not know if Bane was dead or alive and then read you know and then hear his voice reading that letter 
and then yeah. see him in that water. Oh, I mean, of course. And now, like, where the, where is his ship? Where is Vane's? Where's the, where's the ranger now? That's Remind a good me. question. No, I think the ranger was still there because didn't like, someone actually comment on that that the ranger was still in the port? Yeah, that, that's why like longboats right. are the answer. But uh, right. I, I just kind of yeah, and that right. is one of my favorite shots of him. Just him standing in the water with his crazy face paint because it's just yep. such a Charles Vane yeah. shot. Like kind of I insane. Swim across and, like, the Atlantic Ocean. Maybe maybe he took he took Naf's boat. Maybe he just stole Naf's boat. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I need like a deleted scene of this or something. Like <laughs> we could we could ask that at New York Comic Con. Although I try yeah who knows i don't know yeah we need the answer to that you're right you're right i my <laughs> my argument for it not being good storytelling to show us that is is not enough because it had to no, actually I, physically I, I have agree with that, to but yeah no i think i would be able to let it go if season one hadn't irked to me by making him magical <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think there are a lot of people who were just totally okay with him being magic. <laughs> I was okay with it personally. Oh no! Like I accept that the lumberjack storyline is like no, my it is cross true. To bear. It is true. It is totally true. Like Vane, <laughs> Vane is the only. He is the only character that goes outside of the physical constraints of life and death mm-hmm. because he does. Yeah. He shouldn't have survived when he was on the lumberjack island. He shouldn't have survived. But. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's and one yet. of my, like, okay, it was season one. I forgive you for that moment. Right. And that's why I was so impressed with the beginning of season two, because I was like, oh, my God, you just fixed every problem I had with season one single-handedly right. in one episode. Amazing. No, it's true. It's true. Okay. We need that story. We need that. Oh, <laughs> Toby Schmitz. Drink. <laughs> Drink. <laughs> Toby. I got a scotch now. I have to pour more. I oh, think I shit. Do. Um, I'm going to uncork it. Listen. Toby, if you're listening... Ah, uh, there we go. We got the we got the uncorking. You got the sound. Yeah, um, not added in post. That was a real cork. Uh, Toby, go ahead, Toby, we're proper drunk now, so we're calling you out. But if you're listening, we would like to know if you have any ideas. If there were any discussions about how this happened, please tell us. Yes. And on that note, I think <laughs> we can wrap this baby up. All right, Lauren. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, so much fun. And tolerating us when we're even more drunk than usual when we're doing this. <laughs> Thanks again for having me. You know I'm always down to talk black sales. And for listeners, I will have <laughs> a lot of Comic-Con goodies coming your way. Um, I'm still determining whether I'm going to release those goodies right after Comic-Con or wait till closer to January when the show premieres. So, oh, ah. how could you keep people waiting? Make well, or wait. I might stagger it from like line. now to Comic Con, but yeah, no, that so, makes sense. Ah, mm-hmm. I don't know. So, when you were listening comes. to this, you might have already seen some of the goodies or not, but even if you have seen some, know that there are more to come. Awesome, yeah, that's <laughs> so fabulous! Exciting. Yay! All right, <laughs> ladies, cheers. One last drink, <laughs> one last drink. Cheers from Common Room Radio. I'm Liz Stevens. I'm Daphne Olive. And I'm Lauren Sarner. And thanks again for having me. Yay. Thanks for coming. Fathoms Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag FathomsDeep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.